Okay, good morning everybody. Welcome to the VIU lecture. I would like to warmly thank Professor Blockmans for being here with us. He has come here just for us. And uh, I would like also to thank Professor Crum for having organized this. As Professor Crum will say in a moment, this is a special event in the sense that not only is a lecture about a hot and important topic, which is uh, the experience of the state, <laughs> the historical uh, course and origins of the state in Europe, which is particularly hot because the European Union is not going through very nice time, actually we are undergoing uh, quite a moment of trouble. Uh, but also, this is, uh, uh, this is an, uh, an anniversary, uh, no? an anniversary of a big project, of an important project, funded by the European Foundation, and which uh, had uh, an outcome, several volumes, you now for the Oxford University Press. So, uh, I'm very glad there is this opportunity, which uh, no, we have this opportunity today, also to maybe do some discussion you know, afterwards, because the idea is also to have some questions and, and, and to have some sort of discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll okay. leave Professor Crum to, to, to say something more. About. Thank you very much. Uh, buongiorno. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I welcome you to this wonderful, I believe, uh, VIU lecture. And uh, I'm pleased to introduce our today's uh, speaker. Uh, he's uh, Professor Wim Blockmans uh, from Leiden University. Uh, and uh, as uh, Professor Pes uh, already mentioned, this year we can celebrate and believe we should celebrate this 30th anniversary of a very ambitious and uh, influential academic project uh, launched in 1884, uh, 1984, sorry, uh, the origins of the modern state, uh, first initiated by some French scholars like uh, Jean-Philippe Genet, and then uh, supported by European Science Foundation and resulted in this huge series appeared from Oxford University Press, The Origins of the Modern State, seven volumes. Uh, some of them just are standing there in the library. The VIU purchased, on my request, purchased these volumes and so students and uh, other colleagues can, can consult them. And uh, this anniversary is, uh, I would say, a happy occasion to invite Professor Blockmans, who contributed greatly to this project and actually co-edited with Professor Genet the whole series. So we invited him to come and to share his vision of the past and, I would say, the present of this European uh, state system. Uh, so, without further ado, I'm giving the floor to Professor Bloch once. Welcome. Welcome to your presentation. Thank you so much uh, for these kind words. Uh, thanks to the colleagues and uh, students uh, to attend here. It's really a great pleasure for me. And indeed, a challenge. Uh, I wasn't aware of that anniversary. You uh, reinvented it. And it made me reflect myself on what was in fact the impact uh, 30 years after, not like Balzac, 20 ans après, but 30 years later. And yeah, it's a reflection I would like to share with you. What I propose to do is, um, as it has been uh, suggested uh, by Professor Krom, um, to look back on that program because it, it was rather big, let's say, um, then I will reflect uh, at a certain distance uh, on the work done and especially not envisaged uh, at that time 
So what have we learned after the finishing uh, of the program, which, um, uh, which other events, which other initiatives have been taken in addition and as a reaction uh, to that program? What are the new perspectives which have been opened since then? And uh, the program was limited, as you see, to uh, the 13th to the 18th century, which is in itself uh, already implying certain choices. It was not only the pre-industrial and pre-revolutionary state formation in Europe, but it was also beginning at a certain moment. The 13th century was considered to be a very false start moment by the German colleagues, because they said it should have been 800. Then we started with the German Empire. And yeah, even the choice of uh, the chronology matters for the long-term perspective. But it remained uh, pre-industrial and pre-revolutionary. That's why I add now point three and four uh, in the, uh, today's program, namely what happened after uh, the creation of the national states. And fourth, uh, as uh, Professor Page has already said, um, uh, Europe is under discussion nowadays. Uh, exactly this week and next week, uh, there are hot debates uh, carried on in the European Parliament about the candidates for the Commission, the European Commission, who have been proposed by government. Uh, and some of them are really passing a hard time in the hearings, which took already place Monday uh, and yesterday also, six per day, and uh, some are very controversial. And it's interesting to, to see on that basis, which will be important for the next five years of the, the, the capacity to act for the European Union, it will be important to see how this complex structure will deal with this situation under a very strong popular movement uh, of Euroscepticism, which appeared uh, in the last elections uh, of May. So that's uh, my program, and keep me back if I'm talking too much, please. But first, um, these uh, initiatives uh, 30 years ago, uh, as it has been said, uh, it started with a French initiative launched by the National French uh, CNRS, the Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, so the National Research Council. And it was indeed an initiative uh, taken by Jean-Philippe Genet, who was then member of the board of the CNRS as a young scholar. This has also some reflections. Uh, and it was stopped abruptly when there was a new government in France after elections, when the left-wing government was replaced by a right-wing government. This program was immediately stopped by what we now would consider to be an independent uh, scholarly institution, the CNRS. It was not the case 30 years ago. Uh, it was uh, really a coup d'etat. But in the meantime, from that position in the CNRS, Genet already uh, took further steps on the European sco uh, scale. Namely, there existed, a, your institution is a consortium. There existed in Europe a consortium of national research councils and national academies. It still exists, but it, uh, it lost its function in the meantime. But at that moment, it was a collaborative uh, effort, not limited to the European Union, but including uh, many other countries like uh, then Yugoslavia, then uh, Israel, and uh, also non EU members at that moment. So it was a much broader and um, non-government-led institution. I insist non-government dependent. Uh, uh, it depended on the National Research Councils and uh, the National <coughs> Academies. Insofar as these were independent from their governments, the European Science Foundation was not bound to any political uh, action. 
So, and they took over that program uh, with little money, I must say, from a uh, perspective as we know it today. Uh, they couldn't uh, support um, any uh, uh, appointments. No, nobody was paid for doing that job uh, unless a small staff organizing the things in uh, the office in Stras Strasbourg. Um, so we did it all as a voluntary uh, activity, uh, having nice travels uh, every now and then in weekends to save flying uh, costs and so on. So it had to be cheap. It was cheap. And um, yeah, it was voluntary action, let's say. Uh, first, a few words about the, the French uh, initiative. Um, what was new then was the the longue durée, the, the Brodellian vision of the Ancien Régime uh, passing over the threshold of 1500, looking at long-term developments in European processes uh, in the pre-industrial period. And in fact, at that moment, they started in, in the 12th century in France. And they worked with themes, uh, themes which I listed here, um, and uh, which were relatively modern at that time, relatively, some more than others, prosopography as, a, as, an, appro uh, uh, as an approach was relatively novel. It was uh, the initial stage of uh, <coughs> electronic data uh, management, so that was really uh, avant-garde. Um, there are more volumes uh, published that were mainly collective volumes uh, around such themes. What we can ask afterwards uh, is, was that vision on Genèse de l'État moderne? That was the title, Genesis of the modern, modern State. Well, to start with that word modern, the term modern, modern or modernity, in social sciences is extremely controversial. Um, <coughs> what is modernity and what is modern in other parts than, uh, of the world than Western Europe? Um, and what was a modern state? There was a lot of discussion about that and in fact, being a French program initially, it was thought to be a French model. Let's be clear about it. I can tell this to my good friend Jean-Philippe Genet as well, um, and I did so. It, uh, we always had uh, interesting uh, exchanges about this. But what was the idea of a modern state is a relatively centralized state. This is important. It was mainly in the pre-industrial period uh, a monarchical state with a bureaucracy, uh, which was um, in Weberian terms, in terms uh, used by Max Weber, the, the sociologist who published some century ago now, uh, essential views about state and statehood and Beamtentum, uh, um, so bureaucracy, um, depersonalized bureaucracy, that is, the institutions of the state continue to exist even if the person of the king dies. So the continuity independent, the continuity of the roles, to put it in sociological terms, continuity of the roles defined institutionally uh, was considered to be uh, the ideal type of a modern state. Um, and in that respect, it was a different type uh, from the type of state uh, which we can uh, call a dynastic state, where a state can be dismantled, disrupted, split, or combined, depending on personal ties of relationships, dynastic relationships especially. If a king wants to divide his kingdom in three parts because he has three sons, then he can do it. That's the, the pre-modern type of uh, personalized uh, power. So in that respect, we came to a particular uh, definition of modernity. Um, note, by the way, this is a footnote, that 
even between the languages, English and French, modern has a historical, uh, uh, chronological period, a different meaning. L'histoire moderne is, roughly speaking, in France, history of Western Europe, between 1500 and 1800, or, to be more precise, 1789. That's the French definition of modern history, histoire moderne. But in English, modern history is a history after the Industrial Revolution, or even after uh, 1870. So words have already different meanings in such a close area of scholarship as Western Europe. And um, it was astonishing for me to, to note that this can have real consequences. At one moment I was asked to give an advice for the European Commission on a project, a historical research project uh, in the Sixth Framework Programme. And it was curiously labelled as infrastructural uh, means uh, to, to create infrastructures, uh, research infrastructures, uh, concerning the medieval and modern period. And we came up to, to evaluate projects which dealt with kings and monasteries in the uh, Middle Ages and the First World War. We didn't understand until we retranslated into French. It was meant, it was thought in French, infrastructural analysis uh, with uh, funding of the infrastructure of projects concerning the Middle Ages and the early modern. Early modern, they would say in English. One word of difference. And in fact, we had to sponsor stupid combinations of, uh, of uh, themes because of something which was lost in translation in the European bureaucracy. The first volume published indeed uh, 30 years ago was on the, um, in the CNRS initiative, uh, the French initiative uh, on fiscality, which was uh, uh, considered to be, yeah, um, as uh, Kikero already said it, uh, uh, pecunia nervus belli, uh, money is uh, not only the key to uh, the war, but also war being the key to a state, uh, um, taxation is one of the essential features of a, of a modern state. Then the next step was the, the much larger initiative on the European scale. Um, I already mentioned um, the fact that the organization, European Science Foundation, was a consortium. Um, and uh, it depended on the contributions ad hoc for such a program of this size, and the decisions by individual national councils. It happened uh, that uh, in some cases um, the British uh, Council, the, that was then the, the British Academy, said, no, we don't like to contribute to this program but here we have a few British candidates, please pay for them. And the French did the same. And the Germans could object because in this case, in the first instance, uh, DFG, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft, so the German uh, research organization said, ah, this concept is so purely thought in French terms, we can't uh, subsidize this. So we had to negotiate about it. And that shows that even in historical research, present-day structures play a role, and uh, yeah, we had to deal with that, um, and um, I will also uh, enumerate some consequences of the structural arrangements which facilitated this uh, type of uh, uh, research. What was new, I think, is uh, that we were including a lot of social sciences in the historical work. You heard me already referring to Max Weber and other uh, sociological and political science uh, concepts. That was really uh, rather innovative in 30 years ago. And um, pluridisciplinary also within the field of humanities. Uh, we had art historians, we had uh, 
legal historians and so on, um, so people from different disciplines and uh, a lot of uh, political philosophy, uh, especially in the theme of, uh, of uh, this year, political theory and practice. Um, so that are the titles of the, the seven books which have been published both in English and in French, by the way. The, the two series uh, have been published and translated from a variety of um, languages. Um, and I'll come back to that difficulty. We are in Europe, so we are multilingual, but people are not always multilingual. Even scholars are not always multilingual. So that really is a fundamental problem in Europe today, even in research. Besides these seven volumes, uh, there were more volumes. Oxford uh, published an, another one on taxation because that was a very dynamic group and they wanted to publish uh, two volumes and then they added one. And there were conferences of the HOPE program as uh, uh, dealing with general uh, aspects that are the last uh, uh, mentioned in the list. Uh, the, the first uh, general uh, conference was on theory and historiography. Then the second was at the end of the program uh, to look at uh, the extra European heritage. Uh, and so the transfer of European models to uh, the colonial world, in how far did uh, the Castilian model uh, work out in Latin America, or the Portuguese model, or the, the English, the British, or the Dutch uh, model in their colonization processes, and um, also the heritage to yeah, a more recent period, but that was not really uh, a developed uh, program. And after the, the conclusion, uh, we were funded uh, for our contacts, our meetings during four years. And after that, we noted that um, yeah, many people in their own countries continued to organize uh, meetings and uh, develop further uh, certain of these themes. So one effect certainly has been that political history, in a broad sense, as defined as a pluridisciplinary approach, uh, and especially the history of state formation um, came prominently on the research agenda since then. Here is uh, an example of the, the French edition by the Presse Universitaire de France uh, um, on war and uh, state competition. That's an example of um, the Oxford series. And yeah, we needed to to invest uh, an important sum of money in the, the not only in translation costs uh, because some contributions were written in German uh, because one Finnish member could only have uh, as a second language uh, Russian and then uh, as a third uh, German so as not all members of all these teams were able to understand uh, German that raised uh, communication problems but these texts had to be translated and then after translation by a very willing uh, Anglo-Saxon native uh, member of a, a panel then um, we had to pay for uh, an editor a highly qualified uh, English uh, historian with a PhD in medieval history and uh, who pointed to all the inconsistencies in all the translated texts. Uh, institutions have names which are typical for one country. And how do you translate into English uh, Chambre des Comptes? Uh, and um, um, diverse, uh, the, the opposite way, uh, the, the exchequer, how do you translate that into French or in German? Uh, the, this, another example, the simple word of uh, parliament has a very different mean, meaning in pre-industrial French history as in England. In French it's a high court, in England uh, it is a representative court and the House of Lords, which is a court as well. Um, one of the follow-up actions is taken again by Jean-Philippe Genet. He received uh, an important grant uh, from 
the new institution which exists now since seven or eight years, uh, the European Science Fund, uh, European Research Council, which is really an EU uh, institution with an important uh, budget which um, launches projects which are not so constructed as uh, I described it for the Genese Lita Moderne, but which are initiatives by individual uh, scholars. The only requirement is that they are qualified, three, three requirements, they have to be qualified of course, uh, supported by an institution within the EU. And then, of course, uh, there is evaluation by the, uh, these projects. The great advantage of the European uh, Research Council nowadays is that they really pay uh, uh, researchers uh, for five years uh, and uh, with important subsidies, up to eight million per project. That happens in the sciences. Um, in the humanities, it would rather be uh, up to two and a half, three million. But that's important in our field. And that really has an impact. And so, um, Genet is the leader of such a program which is running now. Um, the differences are that there is a leader, the principal investigator, at, as it uh, is called, and there are salaried persons. So to talk in terms of uh, bureaucracy, uh, as they are salaried, they have to comply. They have to obey to certain rules. You have authority on them as a leader. Um, so it's possible to steer more. And that's, in fact, uh, the, the model from the sciences which is uh, being applied now generally. So that's a new opportunity. The theme of this uh, running program which is already publishing a new series of uh, acts of uh, um, conferences. And you see uh, a lot of names, but each volume has again a theme and uh, another set of um, editors. It's uh, that are collections of articles on themes uh, of which the main focus is legitimation. Legitimation of power structures. And again, in that period uh, before the French Revolution. Looking back, and that was a challenge uh, which uh, yeah, uh, was offered to me. Looking back, uh, I think there were great opportunities. Uh, Hundred historians were implied uh, in that uh, ESF program. Um, there was a board. Uh, which defined the general questionnaire, uh, such as a definition of concepts, basic concepts like what is a modern state and so on. Um, we, w we have not started from particular country histories, uh, but tried to look at comparisons and uh, interactions and to look at uh, cross-European uh, features. Uh, one of the opportunities was, of course, to learn from each other. Uh, scholars which would not have uh, had that many and that intensive contacts uh, during four years uh, exchanged information, and that was really an important opening, eye-opening for all these members to, um, to get acquainted with a body of knowledge from other countries and other linguistic areas which they didn't know mostly. Um, yeah. Translation again, concepts needed to be reinterpreted in other languages and even rethought by the, the exercise of translation we were uh, obliged to think why is a French institution different from an Italian institution? And why don't you have parliaments in northern Italy, for instance? Uh, so, translation uh, is the touchstone for uh, really more fundamental questions. It was a challenge to transcend, uh, to transcend the traditional perceptions, a paradigm as it existed uh, 
within each country. Uh, the Italians have been obsessed by the city-states or the regional states in, the, in northern Italy. Uh, the French have been obsessed by their kings and the central, central uh, government. The Germans have been obsessed by their concept of the Reich, which was something nobody floating around, powerless. Um, and um, Sorry. <laughs> I'm insulting everybody in, his, in due time. <laughs> No, I'm just reflecting how it went, uh, these exchanges. And, and of course, the British were so superior in all respects. Hmm. Because their state uh, was the very earliest to, to be developed, and so on. So that are the, the paradigms which came under discussion. Why and what is the early Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, state doing in England? And how did it lead to a particular type of office holding, which is not a bureaucracy. Uh, there is a, a very long-standing tradition in, in uh, British history, especially in English history, of offices which were held on a voluntary, unpaid basis. Honorary, because the people who could do it, of course, could afford it uh, to spend some time in status and, and power. They had their land holdings. The long durée, again, uh, it, um, it cuts tr through the traditional boundaries between medieval and uh, early modern history, uh, which in teaching are uh, unnecessarily uh, limiting our perspective, while uh, the, the focus was on the continuity of these developments. In fact, um, that was a Weberian uh, viewpoint uh, again, uh, these long-term uh, developments, ongoing processes of state formation, of bureaucratization, of secularization, and so on. In fact, uh, we were uh, applying uh, such concepts. But what were the limitations, uh, obvious limitations also, uh, looking back? Well, weren't we too much obsessed by the French initiative and looking too much towards only one type of public authority, which is a modern state? Because at the same time, before 1800, 1800 there were republics, there were uh, um, other types of uh, territorial states which con uh, continued to function effectively, there were uh, confederations, so that diversity was uh, not really considered. Uh, and uh, that implies that there was not really... Uh, we were probably too much focused on that one development, while other developments could also have had uh, their chances. And why didn't they develop? Why were, was that diversity that was, will be the the topic of my second part, uh, why was that diversity of uh, public authority systems uh, like republics, uh, maritime empires, and so why was it replaced in the 19th century by the one single dominant f form of public authority, which is the national state? So we didn't address that issue. <laughs> um, yeah, the national paradigms, yeah, we... We had to deal with them, but uh, they are so deeply rooted in the hearts and minds of people. The Europeans are truly national, thinking in national frameworks, also the historians. Uh, and my explanation for that is that in the 19th century, history has been a tool uh, for the creation of national identities by all these national states which have been created after the, the Treaty of Vienna. Uh, 1815. But yeah, the, that's a matter to be discussed. Again, uh, I may be obsessed, but I was so frustrated by all the incomprehension between elected scholars from Europe. And they, they couldn't talk to each other simply because they didn't have sufficient knowledge of the existent literature and languages. Yeah, yeah. Uh, citation circles are all too often linguistic circles. 
the tendency nowadays is more towards uh, what happened earlier in the sciences and the biomedical uh, sciences, namely the dominance of uh, English, but in humanities that was not uh, the case 30 years ago and it still is not really the case. More so, but not entirely. And maybe there are very good reasons not to be dominated by English language analysis only. Another matter to discuss. The structure of the European Science Foundation, I have already pointed to it. Uh, who were these hundred scholars selected? How were they selected? Uh, by their national member organizations. So, the Finnish Academy, the Swedish uh, Academy, the British Academy, the CNRS, they sent their friends and followers. Uh, the best scholars in their field, I mean. Um, which had some consequences. Uh, uh, people had to meet and didn't know each other. In, in some cases they did, but it was uh, to get acquainted with each other. And yeah, it's like playing cards. Uh, we got these cards. We didn't choose them. Um, in fact, it was something in between. Uh, we could steer, we could encourage, and uh, each team had its uh, team chair, and the German team leader would, uh, of course, uh, be surrounded by a German clientele and a French by a French uh, clientele, and so on. That also unavoidable. So, to, to make such groups working during four years ah, <laughs> is not self-evident and indeed we lost some people in, in the course of uh, time. And some just were tourists. Didn't deliver at all but had four years of travelling. They enjoyed it. Um, yeah, that led uh, the structure of uh, that um, uh, European Science Foundation depended on membership. The contribution of member organizations, not member governments, uh, and not member states, but organizations. Uh, but yeah, it was not really easy, not self-evident to include Russia, to, to name one example. Uh, there was representation from the Balkan, but only one Slovene, who was, by the way, the champion in um, multilingualism. Uh, I will never forget him to translate uh, for a Finnish colleague between German and uh, Spanish. <laughs> Therefore, a small country be in between is very instrumental, like Slovenia. But, um, yeah, it's true that uh, the image is too much focused towards the Western uh, major countries as a consequence of that structure. Um, and did we really come to systematic comparisons? No, that depended very much on the team leaders who uh, were more or less involved, uh, committed and steering. There you will see huge differences between the seven volumes. They were very active, uh, steering um, uh, chairs, and there uh, were others who thought, this is another set of conference papers. Um, that you, that's reflected. So, but nevertheless, these volumes um, depend, uh, they, uh, they brought together um, materials which are available and uh, as such um, a base for further work but as I said uh, all the members were there on a voluntary basis and that made it difficult to say you have to do this now and deliver then that was not possible what did we learn apart from publishing uh, books and that was a, an, an interesting challenge uh, for this opportunity to, to try to see in which way these volumes, apart from all the interaction between the scholars themselves and the opening up of the materials from Finland to Portugal and from Ireland to Turkey indeed, um, 
Yeah, as I said, the state become a uh, high issue on the research agenda. Uh, taking from each of these themes one uh, leading idea, I think, which cannot be forgotten since uh, these books were published, warfare is the primary task of pre-industrial states. Um, Charles Dilliff uh, uh, formulated it in a very uh, punctual way. States made war, war made states. Uh, at least 50% of all pre-industrial state budgets were devoted to the financing of warfare. The boundaries of states were created by military actions, more or less successful. And they were shifting as consequence of military actions. So that relation is really self-evident predominant. That became a real um, um, a key yeah. a result, I think. Economic structure. Yeah. We learned, I think, to think of the capacity of a state to extract resources from a particular type of economy. It really makes a huge difference if An economy is highly commercialized, highly mon monetized, or if it is mainly rural. That makes a fundamental difference. I will come back to that. And that uh, determines the possibilities for uh, the creation of a bureaucracy, for instance, and the state apparatus or mobilizing armies uh, and the structure of these states. Each uh, state structure, yeah, why states? Uh, there we learn from the French sociologist Alain Touraine that states are in fact balancing mechanisms between countervailing and uh, opposing social classes. And the more diversity within social uh, structures, the more need for a strong state to keep them uh, together. And the same plays a role, of course, not only within the state, but also in the interstate relations. And that refers to war and its uh, continuation diplomacy. Um, yeah, that was nice, especially for the French, uh, to come to the, uh, uh, the conclusion that their concept of uh, le roi absolu uh, that, that never uh, corresponded with any reality there was never uh, an ob absolute uh, monarch in Europe never, they always had to deal with other interests in, in his uh, realm maybe major lords or um, depending on the extension, the territorial extension, um, yeah, uh, regional powers, which were hard to control, given the slow uh, possibility uh, of mobility. Yeah, the, re the idea has, has been given up, especially in that uh, volume on law, that legislation played such an important role before 1800. Uh, in fact, it was more the courts, litigation, uh, jurisdiction, which steered um, the behavior of people than norms imposed by a central government which could be announced but n were not necessarily applied. So legislation was not very well developed and moreover it was not really effective. Less so than the judicial system. But political theory, uh, um, yeah, a lot of political theory is being studied on a highly scholarly level. Uh, the great thinkers uh, having bright ideas. 
Um, and in fact, uh, that volume brought uh, into uh, uh, perspective these uh, scholarly visions on, on power and uh, authority uh, by, in fact, uh, dis making the distinction between different levels of political thinking. There's a scholarly level, um, there is the penetration through academic scholarship and people having uh, gone to universities and got some kind of a degree or not and became highly regarded uh, officials. So they were at least learned and acquainted with scholarly thinking but had to apply it then on a practical level. And the third level would be was called um, pragmatic political theory, which uh, is in fact expressed not in treatises, but in small phrases, in the discourse of power, uh, as you find it in, in the um, exposé des motifs, uh, the arguments um, in the uh, ordinances or uh, public acts. Uh, short statements, keywords which are being used. Um, the discourse analysis uh, is in fact the modern way to understand how these political theories re-trickle down into practical uh, use. Uh, not as a systematic uh, theory, but as uh, concepts. Uh, concepts such as Bonum commune, public uh, well-being, uh, le bien commun, uh, such a thing, which could be expounded by uh, Thomas Aquinas, of course, in the middle of the 13th century, but you find it in, as keywords here and there in uh, historiography uh, a century earlier already. So what the learned Thomas uh, did is, in fact, pick up what was already there as elements, uh, stones, uh, building blocks uh, in the pragmatic political theory. So that was uh, rather innovative, I think. And yeah, there was one group the, the working on the visual representations um, uh, as a means in a relatively illiter illiterate society. Um, a state could communicate with visual means and uh, use it for political propaganda. Hey, hey. That was meant to be one part of uh, my text. <laughs> um, I come to the second sec section where um, I will very briefly point to alternative routes which we did not look at in this program. And uh, I will do that on, on the basis of two extreme cases which are interconnected, by the way. The Swiss Confederation, its emergence, its antagonism with the main uh, power holders in their region, namely the Lords of Habsburg, and uh, what the Habsburgs did with their own development uh, until 1918. And they are still around. It's not so well known that uh, originally the, the Habsburg uh, dynasty had its power bases, its domains, its land holdings, its uh, revenues in, yeah, on the Upper Rhine region in the Oud Alsace nowadays, and in western Switzerland. Habsburg itself is west, uh, a very tiny mountain west of Zurich, uh, halfway Basel and Zurich. But what they did, uh, they were holders of many uh, territorial lordships. They were lords. And in the Uh, third quarter of the, no, in the, the last quarter of the uh, 13th century, they had their first German king, 
was not crowned emperor. Rudolf I of Habsburg was a um, German king, so he was powerful enough to get elected after what uh, in German history, historiography is called the Interregnum. There was a period where they couldn't find a German king between uh, 1254 and 1270. And after that, it was a Habsburg, but only uh, until his death, and then there was a new election uh, of other uh, kings uh, belonging to other dynasties. That's about uh, Habsburg, and here is their castle. Note the Swiss flag. It's really a small mountain, I insist on it. Uh, uh, it's a ruin now, well, not impressive at all, but it could not be extended. Territorial basis was really tiny, and, uh, but it's still called Habsburg. Um, it's revealing uh, to be aware of the fact that uh, this uh, dynasty um, became or had such modest origins. Uh, perhaps I should stay with them for a moment um, or even return you know, to that the origins of their counterpart the Swiss Confederation uh, coincides with the death of that German King Rudolf of Habsburg 1291 to protect themselves three valley communities the three Waldstädte um, Swiss, um, Unterwalden, and what's the third again? They are so irrelevant even nowadays that uh, one tends to Uri is a third. Their names didn't come into prominence. And they were really very small, but they made a defensive league between the three communities to protect against, to protect themselves against the the mighty Habsburgs. And what was their main concern? Um, these, um, these valleys were situated here on the Alpine passes from northwestern Europe to Italy. In fact, they controlled that developing trade route and they wanted to keep the control under their own uh, supervision and not handed over to the Habsburgs. That was the origin of the Swiss Confederation, which uh, became a success, uh, um, also a military success. In uh, 1315, there was really a military defeat of a Habsburg army which tried to impose its power, um, but there the geography helped uh, the Swiss Confederation it was sufficient to bring that army in a small pass and to throw stones upon them and there was the army gone and um, 1315 can be uh, considered as the turning point of the Swiss Confederation it had proven to be a success a construction of public power from the basis um, onwards from bottom to top And that's a challenge uh, that became a success formula. You see that uh, even the Vatican is still protected by Swiss guards. Uh, they had their own militias. They were successful in um, resisting invasions from other parties, other dynastic uh, parties, like, uh, uh, which is uh, emblematic in Swiss history, um, the Burgunder Krieg, uh, the Burgundian Dukes uh, invading uh, Switzerland, and that contributed uh, to, the, to the cohesion of these different uh, members, and uh, the Confederation grew with new members in different uh, places, but independent units, cities and uh, rural communities. They even succeeded in keeping uh, Maximilian I out um, here you see him represented um, as he was uh, using visual propaganda uh, 
with the modern means of his time, Maximilian, you see in, in success, but there is no picture left of his defeat, which was lasting. He was thrown out of the Swiss Confederation in 1500. And that uh, is an interesting case. We know that the Habsburgs uh, later on um, became uh, again, uh, came again in possession of uh, the German kingship from 1438 onwards. You know that uh, the German kingship was elective, that uh, German king needed to be elected by the prince electors, uh, that was established at a certain moment in that situation of um, a balance of power in the German Empire with many princes, seven electors, uh, prince electors were the mightiest among them and they elected then um, Habsburgers uh, one after the other and in the 15th century the Habsburgers were successfully enough in in fact installing a hereditary 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 monarchy <laughs> in Germany and they, they continued uh, as you know um, in their way but nevertheless, it's important to understand German history and its confederal situation nowadays until today. Um, why did it not become a centralized state a la moderne in France? Why is it uh, time and again constructed as um, a confederation of state with that image of the imperial power bestowed by the Pope originally? but no longer uh, since um, the split up in 1556. Um, to be elected, each German king needed to negotiate with the parties uh, which were his, elect his electors and to concede power to the king of Bohemia, to the uh, Paltzgraf, the, the Palatian Count, uh, to the, the three archbishops along the Rhine and uh, the, the Markgrave of uh, Brandenburg. So he had to negotiate each king to be elected. And it's well um, known in the case of Charles V in 1519 that he had to pay effectively, very heavily, uh, all these electors to get their support. And there we come to similarities with the formation of the European Commission today. Hmm. But uh, I insist now on the fact that um, since, uh, or in, in opposition maybe, to that idea of the great way to the modern state being a national state in the 19th century, um, we got to look more at the great diversity of political systems in Europe at any moment. And here I list them from the most uh, basic ones to the empires. And if you look at empires, the Habsburg is uh, an obvious one because it lasted so long and uh, got such an extension. Yeah, here the traditional view of the variety of structures, especially in Central Europe. What remains to be explained is why in certain cases you got a kingdom and in other cases even the title of emperor didn't help that much uh, to get a unity until industrial uh, revolution uh, changed uh, the affair. Or what does it mean to be the king of Poland or the king of Hungary? Has it the same weight in real power uh, as being the king of England or the King of France? That are, I think, uh, real questions. Why do we have states and which type of states do we have? Haven't we been thinking too often from a central viewpoint onwards to society, while the structure of society also matters? I mentioned that already with regard to the economic structure, but also the, the societal structure is... Um, is uh, relevant to understand which type of interaction can uh, arise in that uh, 
power play between centralizing forces and uh, existing local and regional uh, uh, communities. Um, so why do we and how do we see states coming into being? I already mentioned the balancing system. There's a possibility that one dominant class tries to impose its rule directly, but in such a case, and I name two uh, exemplary states, Poland and the Dutch Republic, two extremes where one single class dominates the whole territory. The bourgeoisie in the cities in 17th century Dutch Republic, or in Venice, if you wish, and the feudal aristocracy in Poland. They didn't need a strong state. They had power. And that's also, I think, an explanation why in northern Italy, the direct domination of the urban elites explains why you didn't have these complex negotiations in parliaments, parliament and king. So, no need of large states. We can do it as an urban uh, elite ourselves. And there is the possibility that uh, on a supra-territorial uh, level, um, commercialized interests organize themselves in the form of urban leagues or even maritime empires. Being in Venice, I don't need to explain that. And don't underestimate uh, the, not the, the, the capacity of self-organization of well-developed local and regional communities, which made it necessary for larger scale operations to come to terms and negotiate. I think uh, I will point to the theory which Charles Dilly published about this, and um, in, in your class yesterday you mentioned uh, a number of times the, the great diver divergence within European state formation between West and East. Uh, Tilly, in that book of 1990, and you know he is a social historical sociologist, he was a historical sociologist, uh, draw the attention to two factors namely coercion, the means to uh, use power, violence. It can be concentrated and accumulated. So how much can you accumulate and how much of it is together? An empire normally is to be found in regions of Europe where the accumulation of power resources is low. Typically you will find the long-lasting empires in European history in Central and Eastern Europe because of the small availability of resources to accumulate power. The diversity, the low, it, it starts with the low density of population, the weak representation of cities, and uh, so the difficulty to bring uh, resources together. The other extreme, high concentration of, um, of um, means of power and um, their high accumulation leads to strong states, large states, and in between you find national states. The other um, scheme he developed uh, with the same variables of in how far is their accumulation and in how far is their concentration is the other resource, capital concentration. And here typically the effect will be visible in the level of urbanization. The highest accumulation of capital and its highest concentration will lead to very large cities. The opposite will lead to fragmented authority and no concentration, rural communities only. And uh, in between, yeah, you have the whole scala of um, um, developments. 
Um, this is, I think, uh, a major development um, in our thinking. Uh, it has been published uh, 25 years ago now, uh, but still is very influential and adds a lot in our comprehension. Uh, that's, of course, the difference between a strong theory developed by a person, which can be a vision and uh, highly uh, uh, integrative, uh, in integrative for a series of um, features, um, while the collaboration of hundred scholars not necessarily brings together one single vision. I think I have to stop here. I get clear signs that my time is running out. Um, so I did not develop my third, fourth point, uh, but I'm very eager to discuss these with you. Sorry to have been too long uh, for the first part. We just enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> So, to counterbalance this brilliant presentation, uh, which was really uh, impressive, I would be very short to counterbalance it. So, only uh, four remarks. And uh, one, you just mentioned this uneven representation of countries, I mean, in the project. And uh, I think it's really. Uh, important point to be discussed uh, how the how these uh, present day pre present day present day relations in Europe academic relations uh, international political and all that how they really influenced and still influence our vision of European past European history so probably we just uh, reiterate, I mean, or just focus our present day structure, structure of relations upon the past. And uh, there are some consequences in that sense. Then, uh, and well, some examples can be, of course, uh, added. Yes, Russia was not just represented at all. Just Poland, well, appeared sometimes on some pages, but very rarely, and so on and so forth. And of course, uh, Western Europe was overrepresented, so to say. Okay? Then, the second point I would say the lack of conclusion. So now we have these seven volumes, and some of them really brilliant, some I would say not that much brilliant, but still interesting, as a well, collection of data, collection of uh, observations, all of that, but there is no concluding something. Probably now, today, we'll have this eighth volume in a brilliant presentation of Professor Blockman's. So this concluding uh, vision, uh, somehow generalizing the whole project. It still, I would say, uh, remains um, unfinished in a way Projet en achevé, or something like that, French. So the, the agenda is still open. And uh, uh, actually, I just benefited from that because some time ago, probably about 10 years ago, just noticed and uh, consulted some volumes and thought, oh, I see some features in common between Eastern Europe, which is not there, not represented but many common features. So for me, it was just an open agenda for my own work, and that's great, of course. So this lack of conclusion and probably continuation, and you just showed what can be done, uh, probably some words, some uh, more remarks in this respect would be helpful. Okay, the third point. This dialogue between history and social sciences which, to my mind, is, well, uh, more dramatic or more problematic, like this Tilly's concept, 
by the way, we discussed it in, in, in my class with, with the students. And uh, of course, it's thought provoking, but I would say it's uh, ahistorical. So for, for me, it, it, it can be debated, of course, just interesting point. But uh, if a scholar just combines well or encompasses in his vision 1,000 years, well, it, it should be ahistorical because context just disappears. And one century is just like another, except for some figures, like less states on the map or something like that. Yeah? Um, and I'm not sure that uh, war really uh, allows for uh, this uh, well, diversity of states or just can, can explain the emergence of early modern state. I think it explains more the existing or previously existing uh, state system. I mean, the map actually, so it's sort of geopolitical factor, of course, very important, but this inner working of this well, mechanism uh, is not clear from uh, Tilly's uh, theory, I would say. So for me, it's just problematic or dramatic, these uh, relations between disciplines. And finally, the fourth, the final point, the comparative method. I would say that at the time the project uh, was just launched, uh, comparison in history still remained in its infancy, and in, it's still in infancy, and that's the problem. So how to use comparison, and how to draw thoughtful conclusions, something really insightful from uh, these comparisons. So probably that will do, so just some points to uh, make a remark and probably to provoke your further comments and insights and thoughts. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, probably shall we just gather uh, other comments, other questions, and then you will, you will answer. So don't you think that nowadays uh, they, the, the European community, in a sense, with the, uh, its uh, um, policy, is sensible to this kind of result? And uh, the passage from the European Science Foundation to the ERC, which is most, most uh, organized and based on individual proposals, and then the individual proposals, proposals uh, opening to academic linkages more than national imposed linkages can be uh, a kind of uh, interpretation of these uh, results. Why do you think we should put the state at the center of a big research? In which way can it be helpful not to produce new knowledge? In which way it is important for contemporary world? to discuss the state. And why should we speak about the origins of the state? I mean, Mark Bloch uh, no, told us about the limits of talking about the origins of something, which generally gives a rationality to what you're talking about. Uh, why didn't you change the title of the project into forms of state uh, in Europe or whatever? No? To leave it more open and not give this sense of teleology of somehow, no, of, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the thing. And the, other, and the other thing I would like to ask you is whether, how much influence has it had uh, on this project in converting historians who are working on other things you know, to start working on the state again, again, again? The lecture, uh, for me, it's still uh, a very difficult question. You have already mentioned uh, a little bit that uh, uh, modern state uh, since uh, 18th and uh, most the 19th century is national state. But the relevance of uh, studying pre-industrial and pre-revolutionary states uh, for today's evolution? Well, uh, as I said in the first sentence, uh, what we are observing now is a revival of nationalism in Europe. Uh, populistic uh, tendencies are nationalistic. Uh, Euroscepticism is 
the idea that it would be reasonable and helpful to return to stronger state functions and less intergovernmental or supra-governmental uh, uh, actions or institutions. So it matters. And uh, to which state do these people who are proposing these uh, nationalistic ideas now, I mean today, um, to which state are they referring? They are referring to a creation of the 19th century. And uh, we can't stress enough that what is called a, a nation state is always a composite state, unless it is an exceptional case of small size like Denmark or Portugal, where you have a coinciding uh, coincidence or a congruence between nation and state, between community, cultural community and state organization. Uh, state has always been constructed at conference tables after, um, after military actions, after major wars. Of course, also in these conferences and in the wars, geography plays a role. That's why I started with, uh, uh, with Switzerland. We can't explain the, the Swiss Confederation and its survival until the present day with strong uh, bases into referendums. <coughs> for the better or for the worse, they had an anti-immigration uh, uh, referendum in last February, which is with a very small minority they decided uh, against uh, immigration uh, in their country, which... Uh, yeah, can be detrimental for the development of uh, the country, but it's a popular vote, mm -hmm. by a few thousand votes more. Uh, but yeah, uh, that uh, case shows that there is, until the present day, the possibility to, to, um, to survive on a basis which has been constructed since the late 13th century, in fact in 14th and 15th century, as a growing confederation of relatively or fairly autonomous um, uh, units. Rem remember that uh, one of the cantons, um, uh, Appenzell, accepted popular uh, vote, voting rights for women only two decades ago. Mm. So it can be extremely uh, reactionary that popular vote and that's what we observe nowadays also in in countries like Britain and, uh, and France but uh, also in very decent uh, countries <laughs> um, um, where the popular the populistic parties um, get a quarter to a third of the vote that is uh, bringing us in disarray and to which idealized past are these uh, populistic leaders referring to to that state, that so-called national state created in the 19th century where uh, one tends to forget that the creation in a country like France which uh, pretends to be so highly centralized and indeed the state structure is highly centralized but uh, as Eugene Weber has uh, wonderfully shown, mm -hmm. turning peasants into Frenchmen was a very strong uh, uh, civilizing movement uh, where we can identify the actors, uh, namely compulsory military service, greater mobility, um, compulsory schooling and in schooling, teaching the people history so that uh, they are learning that uh, France had to become a hexagon since uh, the prehistorical times already and uh, interpreting and showing maps only of that hexagon while uh, part of France, uh, nowadays France, uh, like Lotharingia, has been uh, acquired only late in the 18th century and um, hmm? long times uh, parts east of the Rhone belong to the German Empire and so on so that we have to be aware of the fact that that national state is a construction 
the construction by an elite which uh, imposed its uh, cultural pattern and interpretation. Uh, I'm not saying that it is wrong. Uh, I'm just trying to understand uh, what uh, uh, is the, the um, problem we are dealing with nowadays. It is impossible to create a Europe not taking into account the strong role states have been playing in the last two centuries and they played that role in different ways I refer to uh, the relatively late national national integration of Germany and, uh, and Italy but uh, that problem um, is just as uh, real, real in other countries as the Catalan and the Scottish national movement are showing, uh, but these movements have been existing in all uh, countries or most com countries for the simple reason that the interaction between nationhood, the community, the feeling of belonging, and the state structure, which is an organization in a territory, uh, but that organization was relatively independently created from the communities, from the basis, from the characteristics of the population. If like some person like uh, Hungary's Prime Minister can go to Romania and talk to what he pretends to be uh, 15 million Hungarians of which 5 million are living outside the present borders of Hungary then he gets 40% uh, of the popular vote this year by a turnout of 61% by the way uh, so he got two of the eight million votes, but nevertheless created a, a parliamentary regime which gives him two-thirds majority in that parliament now. And that parliament is doing things which are against all the rules the, the European community ex uh, uh, established, uh, all the values such as the freedom of religion in education or the independence of the just, uh, just uh, ju uh, judicial system or the independence of the press um, so we are dealing with these realities so there is a popular support for a person and a party like uh, uh, Orban and his Fidesz there is um, even worse there is also Jobbik which is even worse as a purely fascist movement um, even in, in France and, um, and England, uh, the prime ministers are afraid of the populistic movements um, which claim uh, that the state needs to be stronger vis-à-vis -vis in the integration tendency in Europe. It is just one week ago that the French prime minister, Van, presenting to parliament his new government, the third in two years, um, literally said in Parliament, La France décide elle-même. You mm. have to say it in French, otherwise it doesn't sound. Eh? So, mm. To be translated, um, France decides unilaterally. And uh, a week uh, later, uh, laws have been uh, agreed in the French Parliament against. Uh, the monetary stability pact, uh, which is the basis of the euro system. Why is such a government doing this? Being afraid of the 27% of votes for uh, the, the extreme right party, which is a populistic nationalistic party in his country. And Britain is doing the same. The Cameron is afraid of the 27% of votes for uh, uh, the, the, the nationalistic party there, which is the strongest party in the national in the elections held in May last uh, this this year last May. The, the strongest party in Britain is now UP. Um, um, How is it called again? Uh, in any way, uh, Farage's party. Um, which is a nationalistic party. They are the largest. So the parties in government are under such a pressure of popular uh, movements that they move themselves with their policy 
in that direction to try to avoid uh, more votes to go into that direction. So if we are talking about uh, the continuity of the perception of states and nations, I think we, we really have to contribute uh, from a historical viewpoint, explaining that states are creations which are not necessarily eternal, they are a stage in development. In the 19th and 20th century, states became more powerful. They have built up bureaucracies. And why are they so important? Well, uh, in Western Europe, more than 50% of the, the GDP of the, the gross domestic product is in the public sector. So it is an, a fact of life that uh, states play a huge role. But in the meantime, states have lost important powers in the last uh, decades. They lost powers by delegation to regions and local authority. They lost powers to uh, private companies on an international scale, which are much more powerful than any state of uh, moderate size. Take the example of Ireland being uh, accused now of, de of a deal with Apple. That's this week's news. Hmm? Uh, uh, Ireland uh, was cons uh, offering tax uh, immunity, actual tax immunity to Apple, one of the biggest concerns in the world. They pay 1.2% of taxes. I pay 60% 60, 60 of taxes my income. Um, so that is what is the decreasing role of the state, but in the perception of people, the state is still there, and in the reality on the domestic level, yes, uh, it's still there, having more than 50% of a domestic product. States are themselves transferring uh, competences to higher levels, that started with NATO, there. There is no sovereign state anymore in Western Europe. Uh, membership of NATO implies transfer of uh, sovereignty in military actions to NATO, uh, transfer to the IMF, to all kinds of international organizations, and the uh, European Union is one of these. And one, one of the major complaints against uh, governments uh, over the years is that they did not communicate sufficiently to their citizens and their parliaments uh, that in fact who is deciding on the EU level that are the government, governments the council of ministers is the legis legislative body in uh, the e European Union and when Cameron or Cheval are saying we are against uh, Brussels then they are lying with, with double headed uh, messages in Brussels they are deciding, and in Paris they tell another story. If it is by itself that Europe decides, and so the European Parliament, which is the only really completely own European uh, organ, if it is true, then Europe is democratic. If it is not true, then states decide, and this is true, and so Europe is not democratic one or the other, that we have to also to take into account this thing. And legitimation is also um, what diffuses the link which uh, was apparently maybe not um, explicit but implicit in what you said in this last part of, of, the, um, of the intervention, if I may say, of what I understood, um, is that nationalism equals with autarky, autarky. It is not necessarily true. One thing is to have an identity. The other is to want to survive without the existence of anybody else in the world. <laughs> uh, now, transferring to the other issue, uh, I also entirely agree. Um, we are not aware of the fact that uh, since the earliest step, uh, the, the Community for Steel and Coal, um, in the early 50s, it was also an elite pro project. It was a project of governments. Uh, but of course, in the 50s, and especially in 1950, this sector was not only 
essential for warfare, but also in decline. So it was felt first there was a need to make the regulations in that field, and second, uh, people uh, were fed up with war and so accepted uh, new devices of collaboration, especially between Germany and uh, France. So that was accepted, but it, it should not be forgotten that it was a project of the political and economic elites. And uh, the next step, uh, the Rome Treaty, 57, uh, was in fact also an elite project uh, by political and economic leaders. Uh, it was also accepted. Uh, in fact, uh, during the, until, let me say it otherwise, as long as the economy was growing, people accepted. The turning point in public acceptance of this elite project of constructing an ever-growing uh, uh, union came with the decline and in, in the shift in the 50s. But that shift coincided with that loss of power of states say, in all kinds of directions and economic crisis added to it. Um, I can show you one... No. Um, so... The creation of the European Parliament and the direct election and since the Lisbon Treaty the increased responsibility of the European Parliament adds a little bit of uh, co-legislative uh, authority. Um, but often what happens is um, that there are uh, different views between the Council which has, uh, although it are the ministers who are elected nationally but have a legitimate row on the scale of the Union. That's, legally speaking, a very strange construction. Um, but yeah, that's how it works. So the Council has legislative power in uh, negotiation with the Parliament, which has very limited uh, legis legislative power. And how do they uh, solve their, their differences in views? By negotiation which are not public. The Council tends to withhold information systematically to the Parliament. I'm referring now to a document by the European Ombudsman, who is a, an Irish lady, by the way, and also an Iron lady, but in the good sense of the word this time, um, who was addressed uh, by a member of Parliament uh, in, with regard to the refusal of uh, the Council to provide governments about negotiations, straight negotiations with data delivery to the United States. So that's taking, that's taking place, that's current practice, that has never been agreed publicly. That all personal data about all our travels, about all our bank accounts, about all our uh, communication by phone or by, uh, by electronic means are provided to the United States and stored in, in huge masses. So it's thanks to Mrs. Snowden that it has been revealed now. But the question by a parliament member uh, to, re to provide the details about the negotiation between the Commission and the United States gov government on these, these trade, uh, uh, trade uh, agreements was refused. And uh, members of parliament have to go to the, the European Court. And even if they get the uh, right, uh, uh, right decision from the court in the first instance, the council goes in appeal. And even if appeal after five years of litigation leads to another uh, agreement, yes, that information should be provided by the Commission and the Council, but still it has to be awaited uh, to see it appear. So there is an, a huge reluctance of the administration, of the Commission. I'm not pointing to persons, I'm not pointing to, to uh, parties or uh, nationalities. It is a, a collective attitude of a, an extremely 
strong bureauc bureaucracy, highly qualified, which tends to negotiate on a very high level, and that's, that's good that it takes place on that level, but has to deal with powers which are mightier, or considered to be mightier, and accept uh, that interference. Uh, and the question ref uh, posed now by the Ombudsman to the Parliament, the document is public, so I am quoting, 3 September was her letter to Parliament, asking Parliament if it is correct that uh, in the terms of agreement uh, concluded between the European Commission and another country, the United States, were uh, in conflict with the European Constitution. And uh, the question is uh, and, uh, for the Parliament now to to speak out and uh, for the Council to to conclude. But what uh, is going on is indeed, as you point to the, the tension of the democratic uh, uh, justification and legitimation, which requires transparency. And apart from the, the, the very strange uh, construction of the, the institutions on the European level, which are products of the diversity we have been talking to, talking about. And that diversity is a given, a historical given. The embeddedness of nationhood and statehood is a given. It would be un inconceivable to construct a super state in Europe without taking into account all these diverse uh, uh, realities. But on the other hand, the, the construction on the top is so afraid of the public opinion um, that it uh, overreacts by refusing any transparency, even towards the parliament. And even accepting, and I'm um, quoting again that letter of the Ombudsman, um, if it is uh, correct that Interpol, to, to point to a particular institution, um, applies uh, rules imposed by a third country <coughs> which are contravening the European Charter. A rhetorical question par excellence, isn't it? Who are the commissioners? Who elected the commissioners? They have not been elected. Um, and the commission is the only organ which has formal uh, legislative initiative. Initiative? Yeah, sure. The initiative comes from the commission. So even if the parliament has the so called pre initiative, or also one million people in Europe as a great initiative, then in any case the Commission reformulates in a way that uh, is technical, we could say, uh, the initiative on, upon which uh, the Parliament and the Council will dis discuss, approve, come to approve, modify, and everything. So. What is the relevance of states uh, for contemporary uh, uh, for the understanding of uh, contemporary difficulties. Well, we live with these cultural and institutional heritage of especially the 19th and 20th century. People are bound to the state by all means, education, language, culture, and so on, but also by the social security systems that uh, they created a huge uh, uh, bound between citizens and uh, and uh, their government uh, and their institutions uh, on a national basis. Uh, and so the way these are threatened nowadays through the financial crisis and the budgetary problems, uh, um, yeah, really um, uh, show that the states uh, are still seen as uh, protective institutions for individual citizens. So the path dependency is the key answer to um, understanding of uh, problems today. Uh, the path dependency, the, the past uh, developments continue to play a role in, in the successive stage, uh, stages. The fact that uh, Luxembourg is represented uh, in full fledged in, in the Commission and Malta and other very tiny states uh, well, it's a reflection of uh, the way states have been created uh, 
over the past. Referring to these models of, uh, of Thiele, that are models, and uh, in social sciences, uh, models are tools to get a grasp on the complex and diverse reality. They are not a description of that reality, but the concepts and the models are ways to get a systematic understanding of that complex reality. That's a, a tension which is inherent in social science disciplines, just as, as it is in history. So in that respect, I think uh, we have to be aware of the fact that it's not the truth. It is an instrument. Um, what I really meant was, I would say, the limits of uh, applying these or that instrument to be sure uh, Tilly is great and his model or models uh, are news, but are we aware of all these well, limits which are obviously present? And uh, the goals are different, I would say. Uh, goals of research or aims for social scientists who produce theories actually, and the historians who are, I would say, more empiric, more empirical mm -hmm. in their research. Yeah. Well, I'm not convinced that it is a, a contrast between fact mongers historians and theoretical social scientists. Uh, social scientists have these tension within each of their disciplines as we have it. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you need facts, but you also need frameworks to get to an interpretation. What do you actually mean for modern state? Because we have a huge period in assessment on the world, the European countries. But for each country, you choose just a specific period that you call it modern for, for that state? Mm -hmm. um, the definition... Maybe you didn't hear it, uh, or I didn't say it clearly enough. Um, we came to a definition. Uh, we call modern state a state where power is depersonalized, mm -hmm. where you have an institution which continues to function, disregarding the person who occupies the role. That, that's a matter of definition. And in the fact, these things happen at different moments. Uh, and as you said yesterday, that level of depersonalization didn't happen in the 17th, before the 17th or 18th century in, in Russia. Um, that are the, the factual developments. And that may be one other answer to the question why wasn't Russia included? Uh, because it was not considered to be in that time period uh, Ad adequately responding to that uh, definition of a modern, a modern state. It might have been, uh, with, in retrospect, more useful to have that contrast. Mm -hmm. uh, as, yeah, but the Ottoman state might uh, have been another uh, counterexample. There has been a development in the direction also in the European Science Foundation uh, with a program on the Ottoman state. Uh, thank you very much. So, Thank you for coming, thank you for your wonderful presentation, uh, which I would say aroused uh, well, great interest and response and many questions, so it was really great. So, thank you very much. Thank you.